All right, so so I think I should I should draw a distinction. Then you're, you're right. Um, I should draw a distinction between um, an individual stepping up and helping another person. Let's say, like you said, mentally ill, handicapped, uh, drug addict, alcoholic, um, <clears throat> stepping up and helping that person, perhaps against like without their consent because they are mentally ill <laughs> and uh, and alcoholic. <laughs> Um, and then accepting the consequences and the responsibility of that action. All right, I see sure. no problem with that. Right, um, but there's okay, and then, and then talking about the family. Right, um, mm-hmm. now you're right. You can't ask consent of an infant. Right, which is exactly why it's a special situation that you have to, you know, become a bad advocate of uh, of peaceful parenting and unschooling and homeschooling and all that kind of stuff. And and so basically, you know, not treating the infant as an inferior, as a subject, right? The infant, you know, mm-hmm. or, or not, or, you know, let's say a toddler, right? Um, toddler or a child, you know, you know, mm-hmm. treating a child more like an equal, right? More like um, uh, a peer. <clears throat> you know, I want to be a friend, mm-hmm. right? I want them to regard me not as an authority figure, not as a as a as a as a um, superior, and mm-hmm. you know that they have to obey, right? Because because once they when, once if they are raised that way and they establish that they must obey authority, then they go to school, they must obey the teacher, then they then they leave school, they must obey, you know, the police officer, they must obey the politician. So the obedience never ends, right? And you're establishing this precedent of statism, which is the foundation, the, this belief in authority, which is the foundation of all nation states, right? And the belief in authority that uh, some people in mm-hmm. positions of high power or <clears throat> or even just calling themselves government agents like IRS agent or a, mil- or a mm-hmm. soldier. You know, some people have special exemptions to the laws of morality that mm-hmm. we're all subject to, right? So, you know, mm-hmm. we can't rob from our neighbor to pay for our child's education, but a politician mm-hmm. can do it and call it property tax, right? So mm-hmm. so there's, there's these special exemptions from normal laws of morality that we all adhere to, um, Mm-hmm. That are, um, you know, that that it, it, when we when we don't apply them to those uh, government agents, um, you have this really blaring contradiction, right? So, mm-hmm. so so yeah, so so to me, those examples that you gave are not really um, a critique of voluntarism or anarchy because those are individuals acting individually. Now, if you were to say, if you were to say, does CPS have mm-hmm. the authority to tear away a child from a from an abusive rela- relationship mm-hmm. now i understand that that most people would say yeah of course and it's abusive but i actually i don't know if you checked out my interview with carlos morales uh <coughs> who, who he was a um a uh, a former agent of the cps former cps agent investigator um mm-hmm. and uh, and so he was first-hand witness account of, of this kind of this kind of brutality that uh, that daily goes on with that agency but but yeah so so maybe it starts out with some kind of benevolent as most you know mm-hmm. <laughs> most government agents start out benevolent like federal reserve protecting our money supply right um mm-hmm. <laughs> um you know patriot act protecting the patriots right <laughs> so mm-hmm. uh, but but when in fact those these things oftentimes do the opposite so 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 yeah i i, I have no problem with individuals stepping up and helping their fellow man, you know, mm-hmm. I, that's fine. That's what, exactly what I advocate. Take personal responsibility. You know, if you see people in need, help them, right? If you see somebody mm-hmm. on the side of the road, you know, if you have the time and you and you want to and you want to help somebody, do it, right? This this is how um, you know the world is improved. Not by not by voting or or um, appealing to some you know sociopath who wants power over others. Because mm-hmm. you know t- the way I look at it, power. It's an addiction, just like just like alcohol, just like, dr- just like drugs, just like sex, just like work. It, it's an addiction. However, it's it's really the worst addiction, and and it's the most societally damaging, and it's the most addictive. It's pretty much considered uh, worse than than cocaine. <laughs> um, and so and so, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I don't, um, you know, I don't I don't really trust anybody with power, least of all those who seek it out. <clears throat> right. Okay. So. Let's um, let's look at a few things here. Certainly, I would not support the CPS either. I mean, I've told stories that they basically run pedophile rings. They they get the kids, they corrupt judges, get paid off to send these kids to pedophiles. It's, it's a terrible thing. Mm-hmm. But again, here's the problem: an institutional misuse does not invalidate the institution. We all know bad parents. We all know bad. 
people in civil in, in, in what we call civil society, that aspect of society that's not within the state, churches, fraternities, chambers of commerce, other things like that. We all know people in those positions that are really corrupt and, and, and wicked and, and don't act in the common interest. But none of that is going to invalidate in principle the institutions they represent. And I would argue that on that ground alone, the misuse of some individuals, the misbehavior of some individuals, does not invalidate the institution of the state itself. Furthermore, the lack of accountability is, I think, more a function of bureaucratic expansion than it is the state. For instance, uh, there was an article on the Mises Institute some years ago comparing Max Weber with a Mises and their view of you know, this sort of corruption in the state and, and um, lack of accountability. Weber argues that it's the result of increasing bureaucratization. The bureaucracy itself is a system that is not conducive to responsibility. And we see that in the corporate world very well. Like, like, like um, oh, Hall well, I wasn't thinking of Halliburton, but what was that big fraud in the late 90s? Big, uh, <laughs> which, which one specifically? <laughs> well, I know there was that one, uh, that one company that the guy was sued for. Well, okay, I, I don't remember now. There's so many of them, though. That's the problem. <laughs> so, right, the bureaucratic corruption, and and most of those guys, you know, get away scot free. There's a few that get caught. Um, it was Bernie Madoff. He was one guy I'm thinking of. He got mm. he got caught and put away in prison, but many don't. Um. And what I'm saying is this this uh, this problem of lack of accountability is more of a scale of size than it is of an institution. Because anything large, a large organized church, look at the Catholic Church at the end of the Middle Ages, a very corrupt institution. It's large and unaccountable. Uh, large empires are corrupt, they're large and unaccountable, and so are large corporations. But I think it's more a function of size and bureaucracy than institution. Okay. Um, so so yeah. So so size and yeah, bureaucracy definitely worsens. It. Yeah, I will definitely agree with that. But um, but for me, the problem is the fundamental idea of a monopoly, right? <clears throat> so anytime mm -hmm. anytime um the state um takes control of a particular aspect of the economy, right? Be it the um you know the money supply, education, uh, transportation, right? As in roads, bridges, tunnels, things like that. Anytime that it that it takes that over, um. The, the incentives completely change, right? The incentives that that are present in uh, in a private enterprise, right, for competition, satisfying supply and demand, right, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, responding to customer, you know, satisfaction or dissatisfaction, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that kind of stuff, uh, and, and also, of course, since you're if you're a private enterprise, you know, you really have to really uh, satisfy your customers because your customer can just pick up and go somewhere else, right? <laughs> In the end, mm -hmm. so, so that's really the incentive, and that completely turns on its face when the state takes control of any given resource, even what we call public utilities, like you know, uh, electric electricity or water, you know, even mm -hmm. those things, right? Um, any any kind of state control, the way I look at it is itself wicked, right? Because it completely perverts those incentives towards preserving and really um, yeah. catering to the to the individual, to the customer, right? Because again, they're no longer looked at it. We're not customers anymore. We we, we have no choice, right? There is this this is the mm -hmm. this is the utility company, right? The Federal Reserve controls the money. That's it. The you know <clears throat> the the you know the state government you know, it controls the roads. That's it. There is no choice, right? There is no choice in the matter. We have no economic choice mm -hmm. where our taxes go. And again, we're forced to pay it, right? There is no choice. So, so this is the the entire idea of uh, of the state that I disagree with. It's the idea of coercion, right? And that mm -hmm. once, once that idea that certain people should be given the right to boss other people around because they don't know what's good for them... Um, it's for me eerily reminiscent of communism, right? And mm -hmm. and and you know, going back to what you said <coughs> with um, with private armies, um, you know, the fact that some people can uh, get so rich and, and buy up their own private armies and and you know do whatever they want with them. Um, to me, um, I, I look at that as a as a, I'd like to come back to the way things are right now, and and I look at the twentieth century. And uh, <laughs> the most murders, the most deaths 
have occurred not by private psychopathic serial killers or individuals that are that are in prison yeah. and that you know like you know we have the you know fbi's top 10 most wanted and you know you got people in in jail you know famous killers like charles manson or ted 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 kaczynski right mm-hmm. <clears throat> um even those people mm-hmm. cannot compare they pale in comparison to the kind of murder mass murder and genocide that people have done in the name of government, under the name of authority, right? Soldiers mm-hmm. that have been given the order to kill people that they have, you know, no problem with, you know, didn't no issue with, right? They don't even know them, but politicians said, you know, those people are the enemy, kill them, right? And and this, <clears throat> you know, that uh, to me that is that is uh, <laughs> of prime importance right now. <laughs> although, yeah. although, although, although uh, I'll say this, crime has been vastly dis- de- decreasing in in recent years. But uh, but yeah, the the um, the, de- the deaths by government and democide, genocide, uh, politicide, mass murder have all been committed. You know, mm-hmm. far far exceeds uh, any kind of um, you know um, private psychopathic serial killer. You know, so so for mm-hmm. me. Government is the primary mass murderer or the state. Okay, well, there's there's actually quite a few points I want to hit on here. Um, the first one is, you you are correct that in the past, say, 200 years, private <clears throat> armies have not been common. But they have been there. The East India Company was essentially a private army in India until the um, Sepoy Rebellion. And also in Rome, in fact, one of the reasons why the Republic fell was you had all these rich plutocrats raising their private armies. Caesar was, in fact, raised as a private army. Crassus was a private army. Even Pompey was. And then what happened was, when the political gridlock happened, these plutocrats would then send their private armies to fight each other. And then our private armies realized, why do we need the plutocrats? We have the soldiers and they don't. So then they turned on their masters and created the empire. So it is a contingency problem. It's not a problem right now. But that doesn't necessarily mean, and just because it's a less severe problem doesn't mean we should not plan for it. Not all problems are equally serious, but just because, you know, murder is less serious than genocide doesn't mean we shouldn't take steps to prevent murder. Uh, The other thing you mentioned, I think, uh, about, uh, uh, you mentioned, of course, buying and selling and, and being concerned with the consumer demand. Now, the way states can be organized is um, if you look at Aristotle's definition of friendship, he has three levels of friendship from least to highest. The least, the lowest level of friendship is utility. We derive utility from each other, usually in the means of commerce. The second level would be pleasure. Maybe someone's fun to be around. You like, you like, you like when they tell jokes. You like how they make you feel good. And then the third level is the love of a person's soul or the love for what is good in them. You love them for what is good in them. Now, Aristotle argued in the politics that the state was a was 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 basically men bound together uh, in in love. The love being the love that was good in them. Whereas today, what we see with the state and what I see with uh, voluntarism is that it substitutes our political system with one based on the first level of friendship, merely utility. The social contract state is itself a state based on the idea of utility, um, at least in theory, though in practice it does tr- turn out not to be that way. But the very the, the problem is, the very problem that we have now is based on a theory of the state that is itself rooted in the utility mindset of a market economy. The idea that what we need is to be sensitive to the consumer demands of people. And of course they're saying they're going to supply the consumer demand of security. Whether they do or not is another matter. But you see, that entire framework, I think, is a deficient way of organizing society because the high, because if you organize society on the, the level of friendship that is utility, it's the lowest and least cohesive form. The most cohesive form, and, and this is where I, I think the objectivists get a little bit closer to where to where is good, is that you love somebody for what is good in them. You know, the love, that would be the highest level of friendship, and any society should be organized around those principles. So yeah, a state based on the social contract is probably going to suck because it's based on a defective understanding of friendship and human relationships. But if you look at uh, the formations of state in the ancient world, based on the third level of friendship, you can look at Moses in Egypt, in Israel, 
so like Hercus in Sparta, Solon in Athens, Numa in Rome, uh, where you have people through their own, the love of the good, right? The people respect them and love them for who they are, and then the people that manage the affairs of state are bound together by this love of a common good and the good in themselves that they see in the common good. So, and of course the Roman Republic collapsed in large part because that was eroded away because offices could be bought and sold. You were given an office, not because you were qualified, but because you had the money to buy it. And that was the result of the Roman conquests. They got a lot of money coming in from their conquests and the people that got the money first were the people that were, you know, conquering the other guy. See, Private individuals would actually expand the Roman Empire. Crassus was a private individual. He went to war with Parthia, hoping to expand the empire, but he died in the process. But there have been previous general senators who had done that and successfully expanded the empire, and they could dispose of the wealth that they looted. And, of course, they then said, well, hey, you know, we got all the money. We want to keep it in our hands, and why not we just, you know, appoint, you know, buy offices? So once you start buying offices, which is what we have now, uh, the, any co- sense of the common good breaks down. And so, like I said, I, I don't believe that society organized on the first level of friendship is going to be viable for any length of time. And that's, in fact, why we see the modern state collapsing. I mean, why do, why, why do people support welfare? Because it's you, it's useful. It has utility. It gives me money. You know, it's, it's, it's based on utility rather than the common good, rather than love of the good itself. And the love of good is manifested in other people. Um, and when a society, is, when a state is based on that, to the extent that, that any human institution can be based on that, it works much more effectively. And so I, I, would, I would say that I, I think it's suspect that society should be organized on that level of friendship. It's certainly necessary the provision of daily life, I mean, but that's like putting the cart before the horse. I mean, the car needs a carburetor, an axle, and an engine, but neither one of those are more important than the car. Mm-hmm. The car is the, the sum total result. The economy is a prerequisite for a society. You can't live if you can't eat. You can't live if you're naked or, 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 or exposed to the elements. But to put that ahead of society itself is, again, putting the cart before the horse. And that's where I would consider that to be somewhat of a problem with the entire liberal project going back to Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau. And, any, and, any, and even the anarchist project of people like, you know, Godwin or uh, Perdon, who, of course, they said, well, we believe in contracts, too, but the social contract isn't really a contract. That's what Spooner said. But they have this shared sense that society should be based on contractual obligations. Uh, they just differ on what constitutes a contract and what and how a contract should be enforced. They still share that basic assumption, which, again, you're organizing society on the first level of friendship, which is the lowest level of friendship. Society should be organized on a third level of friendship, which, whether it's local communities or at the state level, would produce very, very different results. Results that we don't currently see now. And then lastly, uh, yes, states have killed far more people than corporations, but far and away, the largest uh, mechanism for destroying life is abortion. The United Nations statistics state that after the uh, the first legalized abortions in, in the Western world, and then then thence throughout the rest of the world, over 1 billion people have been murdered. And every year, 40 million people are murdered. The only state that can compare to that would be China, where during the Great Leap Forward, maybe 30 to 40 million people were killed in a couple-year period. But we're talking every year, globally. Now... That dwarfs the state in the same way that the state dwarfs private companies. <laughs> I mean, the worst mass murderer in a state was China, which killed maybe 70 million people, according to more recent estimates. Mm-hmm. And that was over a period of 30 years. Well, in two years, the global abortion rate is equal to China's. Since, you know, since Mao Zedong took power, you know, to when he uh, left power. Now... Uh, you had mentioned that you know you consider uh, the theft, uh, taxation theft, conscription, and uh, arrest, uh, kidnapping. Um, I would I would consider abortion murder. And again, abortion is in China it's mandated by the state, um, but in other countries it's not. In Russia it's not. 
but they have the second highest rate of abortion in the world, or they had it. I think Putin's trying to reduce that. Uh, Western Europe and the United States have very high levels of abortion. These are all voluntary choices made by uh, couples. Um, and uh, that you know, and if we look at the debate, the abortion debate issue within the libertarian voluntarist tradition, we can look at Murray Rothbard and Walter Block, both of whom, for the sake of argument, well, actually, Rothbard, for the sake of argument, uh, Walter Block, he just because he believes it, life starts at conception. Now, what they're going to say is, well, they don't have rights like, say, you or I would, because they lack something. They lack maybe a self-awareness. Maybe they lack. I think Rothbard said self-ownership is acquired when you are able to make goal-oriented decisions for yourself. If you say, I want this, and I'm going to develop a plan to get it. At that point, you have self-ownership. Now, the problem is, if a human isn't born with intrinsic rights, there's no non-arbitrary way to say when he gains or loses those rights. Someone could say, well, fetus doesn't have rights because it doesn't have self-directed will. Well, neither does somebody in a coma, and neither does somebody who is mentally ill or with Alzheimer's. And furthermore, the idea of using mental illness or mental capacities for rights is what the Soviet Union did. They considered if you didn't accept dialectical materialist Marxism, you were mentally ill and put in an institution. And all your rights were revoked. <laughs> so, I mean, at what point, if we're going to define rights by uh, someone's mental faculties, then there's no non-arbitrary way you can say someone has rights and someone doesn't. The only non-arbitrary way to say that is you have rights at every point along your existence, from conception to death. Otherwise, you have completely arbitrary ways. I mean, if you have a third trimester abortion five seconds before the fetus exits the womb, it's okay. But if you kill this fetus, the, 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 the infant five seconds after it exits the womb is called infanticide and is criminally punishable. Well, why is that? You know, it's just, it's just a completely arbitrary event horizon of the womb. Mm-hmm. I mean, so, I mean, you know, it, so yeah, um, I would, I would say that it's completely arbitrary. And this is where I would find that libertarianism is more, voluntarism is morally inadequate. Because, well, maybe not necessarily advocating for it. I mean, I mean, you know, uh, Rothbard says you may, not, you may not advocate for it, but it's certainly legal. Well, allowing something that's evil to continue, even if you don't actually advocate for it, is just, still just as wrong as advocating for it. I mean... In his war against slavery, Henry David Thoreau said, the people that are really the real problem are the people that put up with it. The people that just say it's okay. We're not going to do anything about it. You know, those were the people that were the real, that made it, that continued it to go along because they weren't putting up any resistance against it. Mm-hmm. And the same would go for a system that has it baked into the cake that, well, you know, it's okay. You don't have to do it, but it's, it's permissible. And then, of course, you know, Rothbard later said you could let your star for children or let them, you know, die of exposure. And Walter Block said that, you know, you could let your children, you could actually kill your children outright if no one wanted them and you didn't want them yourself. And he says, say, oh, well, don't worry, there'll be people that want them as, uh, you know, to adopt them. But for Walter Block, there's no positive obligations that any individual has to have. So in a society where nobody believes they have positive obligations, why would they adopt children that aren't theirs? Mm-hmm. They have no positive obligation to do so. So I would argue that that's a lot to chew on, so I'll, I'll let you get some <laughs> feedback. I'm sorry. It's, right, right. It's right. Have lots of... So you mentioned um, yeah, yeah, about um, Aristotle and the, um, you know, having friends for the utility, right? And and I think I think you said that's why some people uh, regard that that's how they regard government, right? As a friend or uh, in a utilitarian way, something like that, right? Um um, you derive you derive utility from it, like you know, right. welfare would give you money. You get right, money right, from right. it, right? Right. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so the way I, um, you know, I mean, the reason that I'm a I'm I'm a voluntarist um, and an anarchist is um, is not re- not primarily because it will produce a thriving, prosperous society, which mm-hmm. I actually believe it will, <laughs> but that's not the sure. primary reason, right? The primary mm-hmm. reason, which would be the complete utilitarian um, approach, which kind of, to me, the other reason I don't like that, it's like it's kind of like um, the the ends justifies the means, right? Which is which is kind mm-hmm. of uh, evil in in the way I look at it. It's like regardless mm-hmm. of how we got to those ends, 
um, it's justified because I got my welfare check, right? Because I got my 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 food stamp, uh, my EBT card, and uh, and and so that's why I, I I always focus on the moral aspect of of statism and and the idea of mm -hmm. of, of government, in that you know it is a fundamental um, violation of uh, property rights and of self ownership, right? That uh, you know mm -hmm. there there is really no no. Um, you know what do you call it? social contract right we didn't you didn't consent we were act we were all accidentally born here right sure yeah. sure we can move but that that kind of implies that the state owns everything which is impossible right because how can mm -hmm. you know it's like and then that kind of goes back to what are property rights and you know how do you how do you uh, acquire possession of uh, of land you know it's it's <clears throat> it's not really um you know like like you know appropriation homesteading and uh or 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 being gifted right mm -hmm. so so to me those are more legitimate ways of owning things um which would constitute true private property which in fact we have no we don't have private property today you know due to uh property tax and mm -hmm. eminent domain um but um but yeah so so that's that's one of the main reasons why you know the state is illegitimate and and that it does not it cannot claim ownership of of the geographical region right because it is not um you know, it, it has no vested interest in improving it as a private um, individual or or family would in uh, improving their property, right? Um, or defending mm -hmm. or defending their property. So, um, so so yeah, that's 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 one reason why I, I kind of think the uh, yeah the social contract theory is kind of uh, you know ridiculous, <laughs> and and uh, and also the you know looking at it you know pragmatically like you know. Um, you know, it will lead voluntarism will, will lead to a prosperous society. I don't tend to focus on that. I always focus on the morality aspect because mm -hmm. I think that's always that's always primary, always primary. Um, and and you mentioned uh, law and legality and abortion. You, you know, saying um, that people people do it because it's legal. Well, I uh, I, I am definitely <laughs> since I'm uh, an anarchist, I will definitely not um, advocate for doing something just because it's illegal. <coughs> or, sorry, um, just because it's legal, like mm -hmm. you know, like. Um, Right, as Martin Luther King said, the Holocaust was legal, right? <laughs> or I, th I, forget, mm -hmm. I forget who else said that the uh, the um, you know you know Jim Crow laws were legal, right? So chain mm -hmm. slavery was legal, right? So there's many many you know the war on drugs is legal, you know there's many many evil things that occur in society that are legal. The war on terror is legal, <laughs> NSA surveillance is legal, you know all these things are legal, um, and and actually um, one of my good friends Dave. Painter likes to point out that um, you know if, if people talk about the Constitution and you know they they always want to get back to the Constitution, um, really how can how can uh, you know a monopoly agency which which would be you know the federal government claim that something it's doing is unconstitutional if that very same entity determines what is constitutional, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a kind of like a, a tautology. It it, it it everything it does is constitutional <laughs> because it's the federal government, right? Unless it it deems, uh, you know, its its judges deem differently, perhaps, uh, you know, viewing the sentiment of the people that, uh, you know, maybe maybe this like this gay marriage thing, if they if they re refuse to allow gay marriages, I don't know, maybe there would be some sort of uh, violent upheaval amongst gay couples, you know, or, or lesbian couples. I don't know. I don't know what the reasoning is behind it, but. Regardless, I don't attach any significance to the idea of legality, right? You know, it, mm -hmm. it, to me, the way the way I look at human action is is um, you know it's very basic, right? You know, um, you know it's like you know we were talking about before natural law, common law, the golden rule, right? Um, you know, treat others as you would like to be treated, or don't treat others as you would not like to be treated. This is another, mm -hmm. way, another mm -hmm. way to put it. I think they call that the uh, the silver rule. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, so so that's basically it, and and uh, and you know, morality is my own law. It, you know, conscience should be the law of everyone, right? Your your own conscience. Now I understand there's going to be you know a small minority of people that are um, inherently you know sociopathic or psychopathic and just loony crazy <laughs> and and mm -hmm. and don't really fit into a uh, you know the social norms of a society what everyone would consider moral. Um, but I don't think that we need. I don't think that the, the existence of those people requires, you know, an overarching imperialistic state, you know, to prevent that. Because in doing so, in creating such a uh, gargantuan entity, we are actually worsening the situation, right? Because we're giving people power 
Um, and actually, that's another idea that, that I should mention is is the idea that it's kind of impossible um, to to give politicians <clears throat> the ability to do things that we can't do because <clears throat> it's the idea of mm-hmm. not being able to delegate rights that we don't have, right? Just, you know, this is, mm-hmm. like we said before, we don't have the right to steal or or kill and call it, um, you know, war on terror or or taxation, but they can, mm-hmm. right? So so this is delegating rights to a politician that we don't have and and that's impossible yeah you know so so that's, that's well, another i think i think you might might have sli- slightly <clears throat> misunderstood the point i was making <laughs> uh, i was making the point that okay so your argument is that the state gives justification for behavior that we would otherwise condemn as is individually immoral that we can't do well what i'm saying is that voluntarism does the same thing it allows you to kill people and calls it abortion it allows you to steal from people and calls it usury um, it, it, it allow it has similar pitfalls. It allows for behavior that we would not otherwise normally approve of, except that it's circumscribed in certain areas. Um, we could say that I can kill somebody and it's okay because it's called abortion. It's called woman's choice. I can steal some somebody and call it usury. The fact is it's not right either way. So I don't see that voluntarism creates a robust moral system that actually consistently creates a uh, incentives for, that says because you're, you're allowed to do it I mean you're not compelled to do it either but allowing somebody to do those things is is not a lot better than compelling them to do those things and I think that we maybe need to get to a more central issue uh, the central issue of, of, of voluntarism is self-ownership I think you've mentioned that before mm-hmm. So ownership is kind of uh, the first principle of voluntarism. You have to own yourself. Mm. And I know I think the first thinker to articulate that notion was John Locke. But of course, voluntarists have 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 taken that as their own as well. One of the one of the more contemporary uh, defenses of voluntarism comes from Murray Rothbard. Mm-hmm. And you know, Murray Rothbard argues that. Um, there are two alternatives to self-ownership. Either a certain class of people, A, have the right to own another class, B, or two, everyone has the right to own his equal quota share of everyone else. Now, he says those are the two alternatives and neither one of them are desirable. Therefore, we should accept self-ownership. Now, this is one of the problems, again, with voluntarism is it's philosophically sloppy. Because those are not the only two options. There are a good deal of other options that Rothbard never bothered to consider. No one owns anyone, including himself. God owns us all. Uh, One class of people has a right to own partial ownership of another class. Uh, Everyone has partial and or unequal ownership of everyone else. Now, in the first case, no one owns anyone. I've heard actual left-wing anarchists argue that. Um, and then as far as God owns us, you, you, ju- you mean anarcho communists? Yes, anarcho communists. Uh, there's one guy named Anarcho Pack, he's on YouTube. Mm. I don't know if you've watched his videos, but Anarcho Pack argues that nobody owns owning a person is not a thing that can be owned yourself or anyone else. Um, and then of course, that God owns this. Well, that's what John Locke argued, and he was a guy that invented the idea of self ownership. And of course, if God owns us, a lot's packed in there because we have to do what God tells us to then because. He owns us. And, and to some extent, Locke would, would have argued for that. And then, you know, the other alternative that I own my, you know, you know, I don't own the fruits of my labor, but nobody has the right to, like, go off and kill me. That might be what a communist, uh, a, a socialist would say, right? I mean, like an anarcho communist might say that, right? You, you don't have the right to your labor. You have to spread it equitably amongst the community. But, you know, we're, we're not going to go off and murder you. So those are other alternatives that Rothbard and most voluntarists completely refuse to consider and are equal contenders for alternatives to self-ownership. I would agree with John Locke that God owns us, which would lead to a totally different set of values and ethics and what's right and wrong for an individual. Furthermore, I would argue that self-ownership is question-begging and doesn't, is, is, is kind of um, self-contradictory. So, for instance, when I speak of ownership, I own a chair. What does that mean? Well, for one thing, we have to presuppose that I'm not the chair. I'm distinct from the object that I own. I'm not a chair. I own the chair. 
Um, and of course, in his rather good monograph on intellectual property, Stephen Kinsella argues that intellectual property is special plating. It's not really property. What is property? Well, you look up the dictionary definition of property, and it's you know the way to uh, uh, declare ownership over scarce resources. Scarce being not rare, but mutually exclusive use. And he says, well, intellectual property is not mutually exclusive use, therefore it's not really property. It's just kind of special pleading. Well, I would argue that self-ownership isn't really ownership. It's a form of special pleading. In normal cases, ownership means that I'm distinct from the thing owned. I don't when I own a chair, I'm not saying I am the chair. If I own a dog, I'm not saying I am the dog. <laughs> but when I say I own myself, I'm saying I am myself. Mm. But that, that completely turns ownership on its head. <laughs> so I think for the same reason of parsimony that Stephen Kinsella would reject intellectual property, we should re reject the notion of self-ownership. Because I think it's a, it's a kind of special pleading, much like intellectual property is a form of special pleading. It's not real property. That actually... Um kind of uh, supports my case the way I say that the reason that I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a voluntarist and an anarchist is because they're very general definitions. Like I could also say I'm an anarcho-capitalist because I, I sure. believe that a true free market capitalism society would produce the most prosperity and peace. Um, but... Uh, but I think I prefer, and, and I and I, I have made posts on Facebook about you know um, criticizing anarcho communists, and then I've been put in my place, um, and I think rightly so because, l like you said, there's many different ways that people can choose to live, right? You know, some people mm -hmm. w in in a truly voluntary society, some people would choose to live in a society of true private property, um, you know, mm -hmm. and, and self ownership, and uh, you know, private means of production and things like that. Um, and that's fine, and that's that's how they choose to live. Whereas other people may choose to live, you know, in an eco village or a commune, or you know, where where they agree that there is no private ownership of anything, which is fine, you know, because mm -hmm. it, you know. So the way I look at it, volunteerism is more like an umbrella term. Um, whereas the only thing that I object to is any kind of coercion um, on mm -hmm. the, on the part of. Well, I mean, it, it couldn't. It doesn't even have to be from states. It could be from individuals. Um, but yeah, any kind of initiated coercion or initiated force mm -hmm. um against self-ownership now now when i say self-ownership um what i'm referring to is that um you own yourself or i own myself in the sense that i own myself and the actions that i take i have to take mm -hmm. responsibility for those um you know whether it be mm -hmm. good or bad and 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 in addition to that by extension that's how property rights uh, the way I look at it, that's how property rights mm -hmm. derive. Is that is that the the the, um, the fruits of my labor um, become mine, right? So you know my income or whatever I produce or whatever I make with my labor or hands, um, that also becomes mine because you know mm -hmm. you, you use your time and effort and energy um, and labor to um, to construct things out of raw materials, right? You change, mm -hmm. you transform the environment, right? So that yeah. that definitely, to my, the way I look at it. That's that's how property rights are derived from self ownership, and that and that. So so the way I look at it, you know, you, you know, you bring up an interesting point. Like, you, you know, you are not the chair, you're not the dog, but in the sense that you know, you own yourself in the sense that you have to take responsibility for your actions, and that and that if you if you do, you know, rob someone, assault someone, or murder someone, mm -hmm. you have to take responsibility. It's not it's not your hands that did it. It's you, right? It's your brain. You your hands are not acting isolated from your brain <laughs> you mm -hmm. controlled your hands right so you own yourself uh, and another way you can put it is you know you are your own master or you are your own president <laughs> or something like that it's like you own mm -hmm. yourself you have to take responsibility for yourself so that's um that's kind of the way i put it what what, what do you think about <laughs> well I, I would i would still say that when you talk about, I mean, I agree. We need to take responsibility for our actions, but uh, a, a pro, I would not say the the response the, the the taking responsibility for your actions is not a property making property. So, property in a philosophical sense, is you have an attribute. So, right, the property of water is that it's wet. The property of the dog is that it has four legs. So, um, having the, the requirement that you take responsibility for your own actions is not a property of property. If I, right, if I own a chair, 
I don't take responsibility for the chair, and the chair doesn't take responsibility for itself. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, I just own the chair. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Furthermore, if we if we understand property to be the owner is distinct from the thing owned, self ownership doesn't that kind of imply that you have a soul that you own yourself, but you have to be something other than you, you can't be identical to your body, because if you're identical to your body. And then you literally couldn't own yourself because chair, you, you, you know, you don't, you're not the chair when you own the chair. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> that's, an implica- that's an implication that many voluntarists might not want to accept. Mm-hmm. So I feel like pro- self ownership is a form of special pleading, much like intellectual property. It's a form of property that is not what we normally define property as. It's a, it's like when you look in the dictionary, what's private property? It says, okay, here's a private property. Then it says, like, beneath it, intellectual property, see here. The way I'd imagine a libertarian dictionary is, here's the definition of private property, self-ownership, see here. <laughs> um, I, I, just, I just think that that's, that's not an adequate. And furthermore, if nobody owns, if nobody can own anybody else, Mm-hmm. You can't own yourself and you can't own anybody else. Things follow from that that are important. I mean, I, I think the anarcho-communist anarcho pack argues for that because he believes that that form or lack thereof of ownership allows him to develop a libertarian communist society. Um, and one could argue that could follow from such a definition of ownership or lack thereof. Um and, and certainly, you would consider that somewhat coercive, and I probably would as well. Um, on the other hand, if we agree with Locke that God owns us, then we would, be, we, we would well be within our rights to coerce people to accord to a certain set of laws and rules. Because if we're all owned by someone, then we have to do what they tell us to. And so if God tells us to do something, then we should do it. And if others don't do it, we would have, we're well within our rights to compel them to do so. Or if... Um, you know, we were a slave and some other human being owned us, we would also have to do what they told us. So clearly it's very important how we define, you know, this kind of ownership. And then what follows from that is very important. And so the kind of world that the libertarians, voluntarists would want to create is based on that one assumption. And, and I mean, Walter Block and Stefan Molyneux, time and time again, will hammer Self-ownership, 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 self-ownership. But if self-ownership isn't true, well, no, it's not, that it's, not, I don't, it's not that I don't think it's true. It's that I don't think it's intelligible enough to be true. So, for instance, let's say there's a square circle. That's nonsense. It's not, you can't even say it's a false statement. It doesn't mean anything. What does a square circle even mean? It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and what I would argue is that self-ownership isn't false. It just doesn't mean anything. It, it's just a it, philosophical concept that is contradictory. It doesn't make sense. And therefore, it's not that it's false. Like, say, if I were to tell you it's raining outside when it isn't, that'd be a false statement. It would be intelligible, but it'd be false. I would say that self-ownership is not intelligible. It's like a square circle. It's What is that? I mean, we have this common sense notion of property ownership that everybody understands. We all understand it. And self-ownership completely turns it on its head. It's like, no, that's not what we mean by ownership in any normal sense of the word. If I say that I own cattle and I'm going to milk them, that's totally different than saying I own myself. Mm -hmm. The relationship between I and what's owned is completely different. And again, I I mean, ownership presupposes I am distinct from the thing that's owned. Mm -hmm. A slave is not the same as a slave master. A chair is not the same as you sitting on it. Uh, a cow is not the same as the farmer that owns it. Um, and so I would argue that, that that just, as a foundational principle, is not capable of providing the philosophical justification for the moral order that libertarians, voluntarists, and anarchists would want to create. Okay. Um, I'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, I'll accept that and, uh, as, your, as your view. So, so uh, I think we should uh, wrap this up. Um, it's been a great conversation. Sure. But, um, but let, me, uh, I'll, let me just give my uh, final response um, to you with that um, in that um, I, I see where you're coming from, you know, when you say that self-ownership, um, you know, has to be owned something outside of yourself. <coughs> but um, 
I mean, the way I look at it is it's just it's just a convenient way of saying like uh, why is theft and murder wrong? You know, you can say mm -hmm. you can say because it's immoral, or you can also say um, that it violates self ownership. And to me, those are kind of synonymous. And it's just mm -hmm. same 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 way of uh, you know different ways of saying the same thing. Um, and so kind of helpful to to break it down kind of like that. Um, and and then and then to me also why. Um, why why theft is uh or why um taxation is theft right because what you produce with your labor right you're either you know um products or goods or or uh income uh that's that's taken away from you by force that would be theft right so so that's your property the fruits of your labor as well you know all is deriving from your self ownership i understand mm -hmm. you don't like that term <laughs> but yeah sure but it's a you know and in any other way i guess maybe it's a simplistic way of of describing such things and and you know so, so like I said, you know, people can choose to live in in a private property, uh, free market capitalist society, or a um, you know commune or an eco village, or or, or even like um, you know distributist uh, mere Christianity, where you know you have this the belief mm -hmm. that, that God owns everyone, and that's fine. I'm I'm totally fine with that. There's no problem. Um, you know, that's all my my primary thing. I focus on the moral aspect. You know, I focus on you know eliminating mm -hmm. coercive. Uh, interaction, eliminating initiated force, initiated aggression. Um, you mm -hmm. know, um, the abortion, the abortion thing. I uh, I don't tend to talk about um, because I mean I understand where you're, I think I understand where you're coming from. Um, it's really it's really muddy, you know, because it's like you know the child's in the mother, and and so what what um, what to what extent can she do with the baby whatever she wants as if it's her property or you know is it is it her property does she own the baby or is it a separate entity so mm -hmm. it, it really gets muddy and uh, and i think um from from my purposes what i'm trying to do you know with my channel and, and my website it it kind of uh, just introduces some unnecessary complexities that i don't really wish <laughs> to involve myself in but i understand where you're coming from i think <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and uh and and i think again um, like you said, you know, there's more, um, you know, if, you, if you're calling, for example, if you're calling abortion murder, um, then there would be a lot more people in jail. <laughs> right. Yes, there would. Right. So so that's the other thing. It, to me, it kind of dilutes the word murder. And uh, and and so that's the difficulty with that. But but yeah, it, it, it just kind of it's a really complex issue. And, you know, like, w you know, when does a person really a person? When do they own themselves? You know, some people say, well. You know, as long as they live in my house, they have to obey my rules. So you know, so it's really. Uh, I mean, I mean, that's that's more a peaceful parenting area, which I which I talk about a lot. But really, mm -hmm. um, I guess, yeah, the abortion thing, it's it's a muddy issue. So uh, <laughs> I don't really get involved with that. But uh, but yeah, so so um, yeah, please make your final remarks and and I thanks a lot. Yeah. For uh, for coming on, I really uh, I really appreciate the conversation. Oh yeah, certainly. Um, this is a, as a final few remarks. Um. If one is going to argue that if we, uh, oh, I would, I would equally argue though that applying saying that uh, uh, arrest and conscription is uh, is uh, kidnapping and taxation is theft would equally leave a lot of people in prison and would also dilute those terms. And so I think it's an argument that can go either way and is not really helpful to bring up in this debate because I could just as well say, yeah, there's a lot of. There's a lot of uh, welfare recipients that are thieves. There's a lot of uh, government bureaucrats that are thieves. There'd be a lot of people in prison. Uh, and the other thing is, you've already mentioned your support for peaceful parenting, but uh, when the, you told me that you wanted to see your children as, as equals and friends, and but wouldn't abortion violate the principles of peaceful parenting? Because if you want to treat your children as equals and as friends, uh, you wouldn't want to kill them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not really I'm not advocating for abortion. I'm just saying, no, sure. I'm just saying it's a muddy issue and, and it kind and, of introduces and, and, unnecessary complexity. So that's that's kind of my, mm. my position. Yeah. And then lastly, for self-ownership, at least the way I understand it is uh, Hoppe and Rothbard and others considered that all pro all rights are property rights. And the reason why certain actions are wrong are because they're property rights violations. And of course, because I own my body, if you violate that, that's a violation. It's a moral um it's a moral transgression because you violated my property, i.e. my body. But you seem to be saying something somewhat different. And I think it's it's not – if you, if you don't mean what I just said there, which is what is the most libertarian voluntarists would mean by self-ownership, to avoid confusion, maybe you might want to use something else. 
Because it doesn't sound like you view initiation of force on somebody as a violation of a personal private property. Or do you? Wait, wait, wait. You're saying, you're saying, um, so you're saying I own myself in the sense that I'm, my, myself is a property. I own myself as a property. Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, I that's view, what, that's my... what self ownership, that's what self ownership implies. And the reason why it's, the reason why something is, is, is morally evil is because it's a violation of property. The property in, in case being your body. Well, I, I don't think I view myself as property. I think, uh, like, like okay. if, if you were to break my chair, I don't think that's immoral. I think that's just, like I would, I, I wouldn't like you, but I don't think yeah, it's yeah. immoral to break my property, you know. Okay. But it, it's it's only morality for me is only involved with people, human beings, right? Um, mm -hmm. And 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 I know a lot of uh, uh, vegetarians and vegans that would extend morality to animals as well. Mm -hmm. But but um, well, yeah, that's a separate issue. Um, but yeah, so so for me, for me, morality is primarily with human beings. So okay. So I think I think there we can probably cut it off right now and just wrap it up. Thanks for having me on. It was a very interesting discussion. Yeah, thanks a lot, Todd. Um, so so if anybody wants to, um, you know, if you want to follow Todd, is there anywhere that uh, that they can follow you or what you you're writing or uh, I guess attackthesystem dot com? You're going to be active there. Yeah, I am active there, and uh, praiseoffolly dot wordpress dot com is my personal blog. Okay, yeah, so I'll put that um, in the description. Um, and, and you know, if anybody wants to help me out um, with the show, please, uh, I have um, uh, Bitcoin and PayPal and Patreon links in the description below. Um, if, you, um, if, you, if you can help me out, please. I love doing uh, interviewing these wonderful people and having these uh, stimulating debates. <laughs> and I want to do more of them. And monetary encouragement is always appreciated. <laughs> People respond to incentives, right? <laughs> so, uh, so very good, very excellent conversation. Really appreciate it, Todd. Uh, thank you very much. So well, thank you for having me. No problem. So this is um, Peace Fanaticism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and TheSeedsOfLiberty.com and TheConsciousResistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. <laughs>